Good evening. I hope you've had a great day today. Welcome to BVJ's Bedtime Stories. I'm Big Voice Jay, and this is a show where we get you ready for a good night's sleep with public domain short stories just for you. Links to all the stories can be found at the show notes at bedtimewithbvj.com. And if you'd like to support the show, there's a buy me a coffee link on every page and post. Tonight's story, The Idol of Red Gulch, by Bret Hart. Sandy was very drunk. He was lying under an azalea bush, in pretty much the same attitude in which he had fallen some hours before. How long he had been lying there, he could not tell, and didn't care. How long he should lie there was a matter equally indefinite and unconsidered. A tranquil philosophy, born of his physical condition, suffused and saturated his moral being. The spectacle of a drunken man, and of this drunken man in particular, was not, I grieve to say, of sufficient novelty in Red Gulch to attract attention. Earlier in the day, some local satirist had erected a temporary tombstone at Sandy's head, bearing the inscription, Effects of McCorkle's Whiskey Kills at Forty Rods, with a hand pointing to McCorkle's Saloon. But this, I imagine, was, like most local satire, personal, and was a reflection upon the unfairness of the process rather than a commentary upon the impropriety of the result. With this facetious exception, Sandy had been undisturbed. A wandering mule, released from his pack, had cropped the scant herbage beside him and sniffed curiously at the prostrate man, a vagabond dog with a deep sympathy, which the species have for drunken men, had licked his dusty boots and curled himself up at his feet and lay there, blinking one eye in the sunlight, with a simulation of dissipation that was ingenious and dog-like in its implied flattery of the unconscious man, unconscious man beside him. Meanwhile, the shadows of the pine tree had slowly swung around until they had crossed the road, and their trunks barred the open meadow with gigantic parallels of black and yellow. Little puffs of red dust lifted by the plunging hoofs of passing teams, dispersed in a grimy shower upon the recumbent man. The sun sank lower and lower, and still Sandy stirred not. And then the repose of this philosopher was disturbed, as other philosophers have been by the intrusion of an unphilosophical sex. Miss Mary, as she was known to the little flock that she had just dismissed from the log schoolhouse beyond the pines, was taking her afternoon walk. Observing an unusually fine cluster of blossoms on the azalea bush opposite, she crossed the road to pluck it, picking her way through the red dust, not without certain fierce little shivers of disgust and some feline circumlocution. And then she came suddenly upon Sandy. Of course, she was startled. Then she became overbold and halted for a moment at least six feet from this prostrate monster, with her white skirts gathered in her hand, ready for flight. But neither sound nor motion came from the bush. With one little foot, she then overturned the satirical headboard and muttered, Beasts! An epithet, which probably at that moment conveniently classified in her mind the entire male population of Red Gulch. For Miss Mary being possessed of certain rigid notions of her own, had not, perhaps properly appreciated, the demonstrative gallantry for which the Californian has been so justly celebrated by his brother Californians, and as a newcomer, perhaps earned the reputation of being stuck up. As she stood there, she noticed also that the slant sunbeams were heating Sandy's head to what she judged to be an unhealthy temperature and that his hat was lying uselessly at his side. To pick it up and to place it over his face was a work requiring some courage, particularly as his eyes were open. Yet she did it, and made good her retreat. But she was somewhat concerned, on looking back, to see that the hat was removed 
and that Sandy was sitting up and saying something. The truth was that in the calm depths of Sandy's mind, he was satisfied that the rays of the sun were beneficial and helpful. That from childhood he had objected to lying down in a hat. That no people but condemned fools, past redemption, ever wore hats. And that his right to dispense with them when he pleased was inalienable. This was a statement of his inner consciousness. Unfortunately, its outward expression was vague, being limited to a repetition of the following formula, Sunshine all round, moth for my horse of sunshine. Miss Mary stopped, and taking fresh courage from her vantage of distance, asked him if there was anything that he wanted. What's up? What's the matter? continued Sandy in a very high key. Get up, you horrid man, said Miss Mary, now thoroughly incensed. Get up and go home. Sandy staggered to his feet. He was six feet high and Miss Mary trembled. He started forward a few paces and then stopped. What's I go home for? he suddenly asked, with great gravity. Go and take a bath, replied Miss Mary, eyeing his grimy person with great disfavor. To her infinite dismay, Sandy suddenly pulled off his coat and vest, threw them on the ground, kicked off his boots, and plunging wildly forward, darted heading over the hill in the direction of the river. Goodness heavens! The man will be drowned, said Miss Mary. And then she ran back to the schoolhouse and locked herself in. That night, while seated at supper with her hostess, the blacksmith's wife, it came to Miss Mary to ask demurely if her husband ever got drunk. Abner, responded Mrs. Stiger, reflectively. See, oh, Abner hasn't been tight since last election. Miss Mary would have liked to ask if he preferred lying in the sun on these occasions, and if a cold bath would have hurt him. But this would have involved an explanation which she did not then care to give. So she contented herself with opening her gray eyes widely at the red-cheeked Mrs. Stiger, a fine specimen of Southwest inefferescence, and then dismissed the subject altogether. The next day, she wrote to her dearest friend in Boston, I think I find the intoxicated portion of this community the least objectionable. I refer my dear to the men, of course. I do not know anything that could make the women tolerable. In less than a week, Miss Mary had forgotten this episode, except that her afternoon walks took thereafter, most unconsciously, another direction. She noticed, however, that every morning a fresh cluster of azalea blossoms appeared among the flowers on her desk. This was not strange, as her little flock were aware of her fondness for flowers, and invariably kept her desk bright with anemones, syringas, and lupines. But, but unquestioning them, they one and all professed ignorance of the azaleas. A few days later, Master Johnny Stidger, whose desk was nearest to the window, was suddenly taken with spasms of apparently gratuitous laughter that threatened the discipline of the school. All that Miss Mary could get from him was that someone had been looking in the window. Irate and indignant, she sallied from her hive to do battle with the intruder. As she turned the corner of the schoolhouse, she came plump upon the quondam drunkard, now perfectly sober and inexpressibly sheepish and guilty-looking. These facts Miss Mary was not slow to take a feminine advantage of in her present humor, but it was somewhat confusing to observe also that the beast, despite some faint signs of past dissipation, was amiable-looking, in fact, a kind of blonde Samson, whose corn-colored silken beard apparently had never yet known the touch of Barbara's razor or Delilah's shears. So that the cutting speech which quivered on her ready tongue died upon her lips, and she contented herself with receiving his stammering apology with supercilious eyelids and the gathered skirts of uncontamination. 
When she re-entered the schoolroom, her eyes fell upon the azaleas with a new sense of revelation, and then she laughed. And the little people all laughed, and they were all unconsciously very happy. It was on a hot day, and not long after this, that two short-legged boys came to grief on the threshold of the school with a pail of water, which they had laboriously brought from the spring, and that Miss Mary compassionately seized the pail and started for the spring herself. At the foot of the hill, a shadow crossed her path, and a blue-shirted arm dexterously but gently relieved her of her burden. Miss Mary was both embarrassed and angry. If you carried more of that for yourself, she said spitefully to the blue arm, without deigning to raise her lashes to its owner, you do better. In the submissive silence that followed, she regretted the speech and thanked him so sweetly at the door that he stumbled, which caused the children to laugh again, a laugh in which Miss Mary joined until the color came faintly into her pale cheeks. The next day, a barrel was mysteriously placed beside the door, and as mysteriously, filled with fresh spring water every morning. Nor was this superior young person without other quiet attentions. Profane Bill, driver of the Slumgullion stage, widely known in the newspapers for his gallantry in invariably offering the box seat to the fair sex, had accepted Miss Mary from this attention on the ground that he had a habit of cussing on upgrades and gave her half the coach to herself. Jack Hamlin, a gambler, having once silently ridden with her in the same coach, afterward threw a decanter at the head of a confederate for mentioning her name in a barroom. The overdressed mother of a pupil, whose fraternity was doubtful, had often lingered near the astute Vestal's temple, never daring to enter its sacred precincts, but content to worship the priestess from afar. With such unconscious intervals, the monotonous procession of blue skies, glittering sunshine, brief twilights, and starlit night passed over Red Gulch. Miss Mary grew fond of walking in the sedate and proper woods. Perhaps she believed, with Mrs. Stidger, that the balsamic odors of the firs did her chest good, for certainly her slight cough was less frequent, and her step was firmer. Perhaps she had learned the unending lesson which the patient pines are never weary of repeating to heedful or listless ears. And so, one day, she planned a picnic on Buckeye Hill and took the children with her. Away from the dusty road, the straggling shanties, the yellow ditches, the clamor of restless engines, the cheap finery of shop windows, the deeper glitter of paint and colored glass, and the thin veneering which barbarism takes upon itself in such localities. What infinite relief was theirs? The last heap of ragged rock and clay passed. The last unsightly chasm crossed. How the waiting woods opened their long files to receive them. How the children, perhaps because they had not yet grown quite away from the breast of their bounteous mother, threw themselves face forward on her brown bosom with uncouth caresses, filling the air with their laughter, and how Miss Mary herself, felinely fastidious and entrenched as she was in the purity of spotless skirts, collar, and cuffs, forgot all and ran like a crested quail at the head of her brood, until, romping, laughing, and panting with a loosened braid of brown hair, a hat hanging by a knotted ribbon from her throat, she came suddenly and violently in the heart of the forest, upon the luckless Sandy. The explanations, apologies, and not over-wise conversation that ensued need not be indicated here. It would seem, however, that Miss Mary had already established some acquaintance with this ex-drunkard. Enough that he was soon accepted as one of the party, that the children, with that quick intelligence which Providence gives the helpless, recognized a friend, and played with his blonde beard and long silken mustache, and took other liberties, as the helpless are apt to do. And when he had built a fire against a tree, and had shown them other mysteries of woodcraft, their admiration knew no bounds. 
At the close of two such foolish, idle, happy hours, he found himself lying at the feet of the schoolmistress, gazing dreamily in her face as she sat upon the sloping hillside weaving reeds of laurel and syringa. In very much the same attitude as he had lain when they first met. Nor was the similitude greatly forced. The weakness of an easy, sensuous nature that had found a dreamy exultation in liquor, it is to be feared, was finding an equal intoxication in love. I think that Sandy was dimly conscious of this himself. I know that he longed to be doing something, slaying a grizzly, scalping a savage, or or sacrificing himself in some way for the sake of this sallow-faced, gray-eyed schoolmistress. As I should like to present him in a heroic attitude, I stay my hand with great difficulty at this moment, being only withheld from introducing such an episode by a strong conviction that it does not usually occur at such times. And I trust that my fairest reader, which remembers that in a real crisis it is always some uninteresting stranger or unromantic policeman and not Adolphus who rescues, will forgive the omission. So they sat there, undisturbed, the woodpeckers chattering overhead and the voices of the children coming pleasantly from the hollow below. What they said matters little. What they thought, would might have been interesting, did not transpire. The woodpeckers only learned how Miss Mary was an orphan, how she left her uncle's house to come to California for the sake of health and independence, how Sandy was an orphan too, how he came to California for excitement, how he had lived a wild life and how he was trying to reform, and other details which, from a woodpecker's viewpoint, undoubtedly must have seemed stupid and a waste of time. But even in such trifles was the afternoon spent, and when the children were again gathered, and Sandy, with a delicacy which the schoolmistress well understood, took leave of them quietly at the outskirts of the settlement, it had seemed the shortest day of her weary life. As the long, dry summer withered to its roots, the school term of Red Gulch, to use a local euphism, dried up also. In another day, Miss Mary would be free, and for a season, at least, Red Gulch would know her no more. She was seated alone in the schoolhouse, her cheek resting on her hand, her eyes half closed in one of those daydreams in which Miss Mary, I fear to the danger of school discipline, was lately in the habit of indulging. Her lap was full of mosses, ferns, and other woodland memories. She was so preoccupied with these and her own thoughts that a gentle tapping at the door passed unheard or translated itself into the remembrance of far-off woodpeckers. When at last it asserted itself more distinctly, she started up with a flushed cheek and opened the door. On the threshold stood a woman, the self-assertion and audacity of whose dress were in singular contrast to the timid, irresolute bearing. Miss Mary recognized at a glance the dubious mother of her anonymous pupil. Perhaps she was disappointed, Perhaps she was only fastidious, but as she coldly invited her to enter, she half unconsciously settled her white cuffs and collars, and gathered closer her own chaste skirts. It was, perhaps, for this reason, that the embarrassed stranger, after a moment's hesitation, left her gorgeous parasol open and sticking in the dust beside the door, and then sat down at the farther end of a long bench. Her voice was husky as she began— I hear tell that you are going down to the bay tomorrow, and I couldn't let you go until I came to thank you for your kindness to my Tommy. Tommy, Miss Mary said, was a good boy, and deserved more than the poor attention she could give him. Thank you, Miss, thank you, cried the stranger, even though the color which Red Gulch knew facetiously as her war paint, and striving, in her embarrassment, to drag the long bench nearer the schoolmistress. I thank you, miss, for that, and if I am his mother, then there ain't a sweeter, dearer, better boy lives than him. And if I ain't much as says it, thar ain't a sweeter, dearer, angeler teacher lives than his God. 
Miss Mary, sitting primly behind her desk with a ruler over her shoulder, opened her gray eyes widely at this, but said nothing. It ain't for you to be complimented by the like of me, I know, she went on hurriedly. It ain't for me to be coming here in broad day to do it either, but I come to ask a favor. Not for me, miss, not for me, but for the darling boy. Encouraged by a look in the young schoolmistress's eye and putting her lilac-gloved hands together, the fingers downward, between her knees, she went on in a low voice, You see, miss, there's no one the boy has any claim on but me, and I ain't the proper person to bring him up. I thought some last year of sending him away to Frisco to school, but when they talked of bringing a school mom here, I waited till I saw you, and and I knew it was all right, and I could keep my boy a little longer. Oh, miss, he loves you so much. And if you could hear him talk about you in his pretty way, and if he could ask you what I ask you now, you couldn't refuse him. It is natural, she went on rapidly, in a voice that trembled strangely between pride and humility. It's natural that he should take to you, miss, for his father, when I first knew him, was a gent, and the boy must forget me sooner or later, and so I ain't gonna cry about that, for I come to ask you to take my Tommy. God bless him for the bestest, sweetest boy that lives, to take him with you. She had risen and caught the young girl's hand on her own and had fallen on her knees beside her. I've money plenty, and it's all yours and his. Put him in some good school where you can go and see him and help him to to forget his mother. What you like. The worst you can do will be kindness to what he will learn from me. Only take him out of this wicked life, this cruel place, this home of shame and sorrow. You will. I know you will. Won't you? You will. You must not. You cannot say no. You will make him as pure, as gentle as yourself. And when he is grown up, you will tell him his father's name, the name that hasn't passed my lips for years, the name of Alexander Morton, whom they call here Sandy. Miss Mary, do not take your hand away. Miss Mary, speak to me. You will take my boy. Do not put your face from me. I know it ought not to look on such as me. Miss Mary, my God, be merciful. She is leaving me. Miss Mary had risen, and in the gathering twilight had felt her way to the open window. She stood there, leaning against the casement, her eyes fixed on the last rosy tints that were fading from the western sky. There was still some of its light on her pure young forehead, on her white collar, on her clasped white hands, but all fading slowly away. The supplant had dragged herself still on her knees beside her. I know it takes time to consider. I'll wait here all night. But I cannot go until you speak. Do not deny me now. You will. I see it in your sweet face. Such a face as I have seen in my dreams. I see it in your eyes, Miss Mary. You will take my boy. The last red beam crept higher, suffused Miss Mary's eyes with something of its glory flickered and faded and went out. The sun had set on Red Gulch. In the twilight and silence, Miss Mary's voice sounded pleasantly. I will take the boy. Send him to me tonight. The happy mother raised the hem of Miss Mary's skirts to her lips. She would have buried her hot face in its virgin folds, but she dared not. She rose to her feet. Does this man know of your intention? asked Miss Mary's. No, nor cares. He has never even seen the child to know it. Go to him at once, tonight, now. Tell him what you have done. Tell him I have taken the child, and tell him he must never see, see the child again. Wherever it may be, he must not come. Wherever I may take it, 
he must not follow. There, go now, please. I am weary and have much yet to do. They walked together to the door. On the threshold, the woman turned. Good night. She would have fallen at Miss Mary's feet, but at the same moment the young girl reached out her arms, caught the sinful woman to her own pure breast for one brief moment, and then closed and locked the door. It was with a sudden sense of great responsibility that profane Bill took the reins of the Slumgullion stage the next morning, for the schoolmistress was one of his passengers. As he entered the high road, in obedience to a pleasant voice from the inside, he suddenly reined up his horses and respectfully waited as Tommy hopped out at the command of Miss Mary. Not that bush, Tommy, the next. Tommy whipped out his new pocket knife and, cutting a branch from a tall azalea bush, returned with it to Miss Mary. All right now? All right. And the stage door closed on the idol of Red Gulch. We're always looking for great stories like this one to feature on the show. You can send your story suggestions to bigvoicej at gmail.com. We've got a YouTube channel full of stories from the show. Play it all night long. Go to tiny.cc slash bbjbedtime. Don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps to spread the word that we're putting people to sleep every single night. And if you'd like to support the show, there's a Buy Me a Coffee link on every page and post. Thank you so much for listening. Good night. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>